So welcome everybody to CLF LA's uh, SE 2050 intro event. Um, as you guys probably know, the SE 2050 commitment launched today at Greenbuild. So Luke is going to give us an introduction to that. Um, but I guess first, for anybody who's new, I'll tell you guys a bit about CLF. Um, so we got started earlier this year in around May. And these lovely people on your screen are our hub instigators. So we've been trying to organize a bunch of great um, embodied carbon related events for you all to attend. Next slide. So a couple of things, and I think Jill is gonna share a link in the chat maybe to the Carbon Leadership Forum online community, which is a great online forum where all of the embodied carbon geeks like to gather um, a lot of interesting conversations um, on different focus group areas. If you have a question about embodied carbon, go there and ask it because there's a lot of smart people. Um, we, CLF LA, are a hub of the larger Carbon Leadership Forum and there are a bunch of local hubs in other cities all over the country. So if you wanna connect with all of the other local hubs, uh, the community is the place to do it. Uh, we generally meet the third Thursday of every month, although this month and next month are exceptions because of the holidays. So our next meeting is going to be uh, December 10th, and we will be talking about our plans for next year. So since we just got started, we've had a couple of great events, but we really want feedback from the rest of our community about what you guys want to see in 2021, what's going to be really helpful for you and, and fun and interesting. Um, so a couple of other items, um, the Carbon Positive Reset online conference happened recently and there are recordings available online. So many great embodied carbon topics, check it out. Uh, and upcoming is the Global Concrete Summit, November 30th to December 10th. So that's also something you guys might be interested in checking out. Oh, so, yeah, there's... Go for I had some slides or uh, some some links here, Laura. There's been a lot of uh, uh, news since the last meeting. Uh, everything from Japan declaring that it's going to be carbon neutral by 2050, the uh, Fed calling out climate change as a stability risk, and of course, um, everyone's very aware of the election results and um, what that means for uh, the the next. Um, President's climate plan. So lots of excitement, lots of things. I mean, monthly, it seems like this, uh, there's always news. I mean, Japan's joining South Korea, and I think the EU all have made uh, commitments to decarbonization. So just kind of reiterating the importance of this topic and um, what we're all gathering and working on. Yeah, so that brings us to tonight's presentation. Um, so I will introduce Luke, who many of you seem to already know. Um, Luke is an engineer at TT, and he is a he's a member of the SE 2050 Leadership Committee. So he was one of the people who brought you this wonderful SE 2050 commitment, and we're going to hear all about it right from him. And then I will be talking a little bit more about the Embodied Carbon Action Plan framework and how you might apply it to your own practice. Great, thanks, Laura. Yep, so that's the agenda. We're gonna try to keep the first part of this, our two sections, fairly brief, maybe like the first 30 minutes today, um, and then give ample time for a discussion and even uh, the option to kickstart an ECAP later on. So jumping right into it and um, thinking about embodied carbon. Um, so this is uh, an objectively terrible slide, right? There's uh, a lot of white space here, but um, this is kind of the world we live in where we, we're designing for uh, and see what's around us. And when we think about embodied carbon, we're really being asked to see the broader life cycle of our materials from where they're coming from all the way to what happens uh, at the end of life. Um, and this is something that we've become pretty accustomed to, you know, uh, from driving, we're aware of carbon emissions due to uh, burning fossil fuels or the, the choices um, our diet has on uh, emissions. 
and really concrete and other building materials are the same thing. Um, does anyone know what uh, the this picture on the left is? I'm gonna call out uh, someone random. David, do you know what this picture is? Hey, um, yeah. no, I do not. It is a concrete clinker. It's a, so it's what's um, used to make cement and this is important because a clinker uh, takes uh, high temperatures and a lot of energy to produce this material that's essential for concrete, right? Um, so the heat and energy produces emissions as well as the chemical process. And it's something that you know we don't necessarily think about um, when we're specifying or designing uh, structural engineers or building designers, but um, has a big impact. And, why do we need to think about this? I'm sure folks have are aware of the climate change issues. Um, here's a, a, a plot on the left of emissions um, and a plot on the right of, which I find uh, objectively terrifying by the International Pl uh, Panel on Climate Change of the reductions we have to make to meet uh, a 1.5 degree future that are set by climate science. So. And recent studies have shown just what impact the, the built environment and our materials have on um, these missions. And particularly important as we look back at that slide and the, the big dip uh, that we need to, to make, the next 10 years are, are critical to meeting targets. And um, the missions from our built environment will primarily be from embodied carbon. So once we specify that concrete, once it's made, we can't get those emissions back, right? So this just shows it's really important that we be mindful of those uh, emissions. And this can seem a bit daunting, but I think we can all choose to see the, the kind of opportunity in this. Here's kind of contextualizing what an impact we can uh, make by um, reducing embodied carbon. So this is just showing a comparison to, um, you know, changing your dietary uh, choices to uh, driving. And you can see we can have a much larger impact by, you know, just doing our jobs and doing our jobs well. And so I think this is something we can, uh, you know, take to the next dinner party. And next time your friend uh, tells you they're going vegan, you can say, you know, on your last uh, building that you designed, you reduced enough carbon for the whole uh, Dodgers team, baseball team to go vegan, right? So it's a big impact. And this is where SC2050 came into play. Uh, they saw um, uh, AIA making reductions in uh, operating carbon back in 2015 and the Carbon Leadership Forum, so our mothership here, um, said that doesn't work because for structural engineers because it doesn't include embodied carbon back then. So they saw an opportunity um, to call to action uh, structural engineers and uh, their stance was all structural engineers should uh, understand, reduce, and ultimately eliminate embodied carbon by 2050. And that's aligning with the, the 2050 goal originally of being uh, net zero embodied carbon. That call to action was eventually picked up by SEI and um, has become the SE 2050 commitment program, which just launched today. So, it's very exciting, and the um, uh, the goal of this program is really to provide designers the resources that they need to uh, make an impact. So this plot represents sort of uh, where we are, which is kind of a trajectory of B. We're an inherently kind of slow-moving industry, and we really need to get that A <laughs> uh, picked up. Um, so making people aware of what embodied carbon is. I know it's not something I was taught in structural engineering school. Um, 
and sharing resources to empower engineers to um, be aware of the, the decisions that we can make and the impacts of those design decisions. And so for the last year, uh, there's been a team of volunteers, uh, myself and a, a lot of other engineers across firms and across the country working to compile resources and uh, create this SE 2050 plan. So there's an, a website, uh, Jill, it'd be great to drop that in the chat, se2050.org. Um, that is a place that is compiling these resources and providing engineers tools like the ECOM tool, which is embodied carbon order of magnitude uh, tool. So you can uh, go online and you plug in material quantities and it will give you an order of magnitude estimate of what your embodied carbon would be. Another white paper that was published recently was is the uh, how to get to zero paper. And I think this is really important because on its face, you know, you say we're going to reduce embodied carbon um, to zero and that's, it can be sort of uh, abstract and it's, it is a moonshot, right? Like how do you make something zero uh, emissions? And this paper kind of breaks it down and gives you a sense of it's, it's not as um, uh, crazy as you might think, you know, we have a really important role to play as engineers, but there are also other pieces like um, electrification of the grid, a lot of things that um, uh, to give you an idea of different paths of how we can actually get to zero. So that's a great resource. And the program itself has been structured in a way that there are three requirements. Uh, you, you need to write a commitment letter uh, affirming that your um, your firm is committed to the goals of the SC2050 program. You need to uh, write an embodied carbon action plan, which Laura is going to talk about. And uh, you need to submit data to a centralized database. And this last piece is really important because um, uh, we need data to, to make proper um, targets and understand where we are right now with our buildings, as well as set benchmarks and uh, feasible targets to achieve goals of, of where we're headed, right? So this is, uh, through this program, kind of bringing the structural engineering AEC community together to uh, get the data that we essentially need to make informed decisions. And so, just touching on the ECAP and then Laura will take it much further. ECAP is really uh, the framework of uh, the program and what we, we saw as kind of the essentials of what this program would need. So it, it requires an education section. So we need to get people up to speed on what embodied carbon is and how to reduce it. Um, reporting, that's the, the database aspect reduction strategies, that's kind of the meat and potatoes of actually making an impact. And then the last piece is advocacy. So that's more external facing education, if you will, and really steering uh, the culture of our industry in the right direction. Um, one important piece is all of these uh, ECAPs will be made public. So there's a, a big emphasis on kind of knowledge sharing and um, collaboration to, to reach this really uh, big goal of reducing embodied carbon net zero by 2050. So that's at a high level. And um, I'm going to hand it off now to Laura, who's actually been uh, enacting this uh, embodied carbon action plan. So here we go. I'm going to stop sharing, Laura. Thanks, Luke. And I just realized that I forgot at the beginning of the meeting to launch the poll. So I'm going to do it now. Oh, right. Um, we have one poll question. We just want to understand how many people here are structural engineers and how many people are maybe other AEC professionals who are just interested in learning about SE 2050. So.
Oh, good. We have one actor. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we have 87% structural engineers. We have three people who are um, other AEC professionals. And oh, we got two actors who play structural engineers on TV. I didn't even think there were that many we structural need, engineers on more, TV. Yeah, TV shows with uh, structural engineers. All right. There we go. With that, I'm going to let's see, get my presentation set up and share the screen here. Um, sorry, guys. Zoom is oh, and we a will, difficult. yeah, I should say we will have plenty of time to discuss after Laura's presentation. But if anyone has any questions, too, please feel free to type in the chat or um, raise a hand. All right, can we see my screen? Good to go. Excellent. Laura. So one of the things you may have noticed in the event materials is the letters after my name are not PE, they are AIA. Um, so I am an architect. I work at Walter P. Moore in the enclosure group, um, but I also work with a lot of structural engineers who are participating in the SE 2050 challenge. So we've been thinking about how to implement, uh, to create and implement an embodied carbon action plan for our structures group, but also how to use that framework to look at the work that other practice areas do. So I'm gonna to touch on that a little bit and I'm also gonna tell you guys about the components of the Embodied Carbon Action Plan and some things to consider as you're putting yours together. Uh, so as Luke talked about a little bit, um, the Embodied Carbon Action Plan is a document that you're gonna make um, that will kind of lay out how you're gonna, how you're gonna achieve these four components of educating your staff in embodied carbon and how to track it, uh, reporting it back to SE 2050, uh, and how you will document and implement reduction strategies in your practice, and finally, how you'll advocate within the industry. So every firm is different, and there are going to be different strategies that work for different people. So uh, we'll just think about how to, how to customize it to your firm and what you do. So there are a couple of guidance documents available on the SE 2050 website that lay out all of the requirements for the program and specifically the requirements for the Embodied Carbon Action Plan. So I think we have links to those that will be shared in the chat. Uh, within the ECAP, there are some specific requirements that you have to do, and then there are a bunch of items that are electives. So when you're thinking about which electives you're gonna pick, they're you know, looking at which ones will be the most impactful for your specific practice and which ones are also the most achievable for you. Uh, so the four components, like Luke mentioned, are education, reporting, reduction, and advocacy. So I'll go through some strategies for each one of those, starting with education. So the four requirements for education are announcing your pledge, creating your education plan, nominating a champion, and presenting the Embodied Carbon 101. So announcing your pledge, I think, is actually a really, a really important part of getting everybody on board and having your firm's leadership kind of communicate to everyone that this is a priority to the firm. Um, and then creating your education plan, figuring out, okay, like what software are you gonna use? How are you gonna train people? who's going to be tracking this, how are we going to drive this process forward, um, and in terms of nominating a champion, there should be a firm-wide champion, but if you're a multi-office firm, you probably want to have one person in each office, or if you have different practice areas, maybe one person in each practice area. Um, I've become a champion for embodied carbon in our enclosure practice area just because I'm one of the most outspoken people on it, and I've been really enthusiastic about pushing this forward and hopefully you'll find other people on your team who are also really enthusiastic. Um, and finally, presenting Embodied Carbon 101 to everybody in your firm so that everyone really understands why it is we're doing this and what kind of impact that we can all have. So one of my slides is missing, that's sad. Well, there are some really great resources uh, available online, including um, Boston Society of Architects has a great video series on Embodied Carbon 101. Um, and there are also some of the technical documents that Luke talked about. And I think we have links to those that we're going to share in the chat. Uh, so the next piece, which is really, I feel like the meat of the commitment is reporting. So the minimum reporting requirements are if you have multiple offices, at least two projects per office. And 
for a total of at least five projects per firm. So these are the minimum requirements. Uh, but you might want to track more projects, especially if you work at a really broad range of scales or a really broad range of building types. Part of the tracking is to really understand where the carbon is in your projects. So you want to find things that are really representative of the kind of work that you do. So when you're asking yourself, what are you going to track and how are you going to track it? Um, I would advise you to not just track sustainable quote unquote projects or like the projects with the loftiest sustainability goals. Part of the tracking is to produce a really good data set and to have a, a, a representative data set, we need all of the projects. So if you start by tracking the ones that are kind of most typical and most representative of your firm's work, that's where you're gonna understand really where you can make the biggest impact. Um, the next piece is getting people on board to do the tracking and reporting. So I think educating project managers on the importance of tracking is really key because to a lot of project managers, it's just like, oh, this is just another thing I have to do. I don't really think it's that important because my client is really worried about some other thing. Um, but if people really understand why this is important, they'll you know, set aside a couple hours for somebody on their team to do it. Um, and kind of going back to the education piece, making sure that members of each project team are trained on how to extract quantities, how to use LCA tools and measure embodied carbon. Um, and then the next question is to ask yourself is how will you extract the quantities and how often? So one of the things that we did is we developed just a really standard, easy to fill out spreadsheet that we can send to all the project managers whose projects we want data on to say, hey, just have somebody fill this out. And then we know that we're getting really consistent data back from people that kind of matches the format that we want and includes everything that we want included. Um, and then, so this is an example of, of our tracking template. It's really simple, it's really unified, it's really consistent. Um, so the next piece is thinking about uh, which LCA software you're gonna use. So there's a number of softwares available out there. As Luke mentioned, the Embodied Carbon Order of Magnitude tool is also something that is available. Um, so that spreadsheet that I showed, um, really closely matches the inputs for the embodied carbon order of magnitude tool. So the great thing about this tool is that um, it's really easy to get started. It's not a full blown LCA software. It's something that'll really quickly, really easily get you an estimate of your embodied carbon if you have quantities. So all you gotta do is get quantities, you can get your numbers and you can start tracking. Uh, and finally, which LCA methodology are you going to use? So some of this might be governed by what tool you're using. For example, the, the Ecom tool, it only does A1 through A3, which is this, this product life cycle stage in orange on the left, whereas something like Tally will do all of these. So that's another thing to think about. When you're tracking your different projects, you want to make sure that um, that you're tracking them consistently so you're comparing apples to apples if one project has all of these stages and the other one only has a1 to a3 then you're not getting a fair comparison uh, so the next piece is strategies for reduction um, and we there are a lot of kind of embodied carbon reduction strategies that are out there and what you'll learn as you go through and start tracking your data is you'll learn kind of where the hot spots are in your projects and which strategies are going to work best for you so this is an example uh, of a little Power BI dashboard that we use to track embodied carbon in a project throughout the, throughout the design process. Um, so we're understanding as the design is changing what, ch what changes are increasing or reducing the embodied carbon and, and by how much. So it's a really neat little visualization tool that we can input our data and, and get these cool graphics and doing something like this will also get you an elective credit on the SE 2050 requirements. There's one for data visualization, so that's one to consider using. Um, and the next piece I want to talk about is uh, kind of applying the principles of this to different practice areas. So a lot of the firms sign on that are going to sign on to SE 2050 are multidiscipline firms. So the commitment and the tracking is really about the primary structure. Doesn't really include the enclosure, which is kind of my department, but I've still been thinking about and working with our structural team to think about how I would apply those principles and that tracking 
to our enclosure projects. So we're thinking about, you know, we're starting to create our own little internal database and maybe we're not publicly tracking that, but it's still something that we're doing. Um, so the first piece is kind of tracking and comparing at the system level. So our structural engineering side um, example has a couple of floor assemblies and our enclosure engineering side has a bunch of different enclosure assemblies that we're kind of tracking and comparing and knowing. So we know kind of what to expect when we start using this stuff in our projects. Um, and then tracking, obviously, at the full project level. Um, so I've just listed here some different considerations for reduction that we might look at in our different practice areas. So finally is advocacy. Um, how are we advocating for embodied carbon reduction in our industry and really moving things forward? Um, so some of the things you can do are share case studies. We would love in CLF LA to see more presentations of case studies that include embodied carbon reduction. So that can be part of your ECAP and it can also be a contribution to this group if you guys are interested. Um, sharing lessons learned and reduction strategies and best practices. Uh, another thing that CLF is, is really interested in is advocating for policy change. Um, you can also request EPDs as part of your specifications. That will hopefully get you some reductions on your projects, but it will also push manufacturers to start producing EPDs and then start looking at their process and how they can reduce the carbon in their manufacturing processes. And finally, talk to your clients about SE2050. Um, so just one little one little advocacy piece that we're doing is we re release a stewardship report every year and this was this year's stewardship report on embodied carbon so we looked at embodied carbon reduction strategies across different practice areas that we have and across different project types and so if you guys are interested in checking this out i can post a link in the chat after i'm done presenting um, and so I guess kind of the last thing I want to say is you don't have to track every single project through SE 2050, but I would encourage everyone to think about on every single project, where is the carbon? Are there any opportunities here for carbon reduction? Even if you're not doing the full tracking on every single one, you can still start to think about it. And once you know the hotspots from your tracking, you'll be able to, you'll, you'll really know kind of on an instinctive level what you can do. So with that, um, we will start our discussion groups and we'll talk about, I hope, I think we, what we hope is that everyone here can leave understanding what their next step is in their own practice. Yeah, thanks, Laura. That was, that was really great. And um, yeah, I would just like to also reiterate one thing that I, I think I failed to mention, but um, this whole program is, has been developed and driven uh, on an entirely volunteer basis. So it's really, um, I think we all know that's like, that's a lot of information that Laura just shared and there's, there's some um, learning curve for everyone, right? That I, I think is important to recognize and appreciate. And really I think what we're trying to do with this CLF community and you know other hubs are trying to do as well is provide support and resources to have um, you know the information at hand that can make an impact like um, and it can be relatively small things like uh, you know concrete specification there's some some things that you can do that don't necessarily have an impact to cost or schedule it's just knowing that they can have an impact and and doing something about it so. With that, is there anything else? Are we missing anything else, Laura? I'm sure I've forgotten to say something. Um, or I think we have I think we have time to share additional thoughts in the chat. In the Perfect. in the chat in the uh, discussion. Are there any uh, questions before we break out into groups? I do think it it is a good goal that Laura said is like um, first just downloading the uh, uh, the program requirements and guidance document would be a great first step for everyone and then if everyone could you know take one baby step further and think about the next thing they can do to um, kind of learn or commit to the program I think that those two things would be a big achievement for our 
meeting here today. And with that, do we, um, should I split us into two breakout rooms? Yeah, do we want